I did something last night, guys, that I, I usually don't do on the night before a show, and that's go out. And uh, I went to Saratoga, and uh, I'll have a couple beers, I'm thinking, with buddies, and make it a short night, because I want to have energy for you guys. And they had a band there that was outstanding. And a lot of you that know me know I'm not a dancer by any means, but uh, we all got up on the dance floor, and it was great. And the band covered all genres. Uh, they played Twist and Shout. Imagine this, I got up and twisted and shouted. <laughs> they played Van Halen's Jump. I got up and jumped. They played Come On Eileen, I got arrested. <laughs> so I'm lucky to be here. <laughs> I got out early. I, uh, I've had a real busy month in February, and, uh, and you know, as I get ready to do a show, and I have friends here from Albany, let's hear it for the Albany folks. <laughs> and, uh, these, these poor bastards, they, uh, they, they're my friends on a full-time basis and have to, I, I try jokes on them all the time. First of all, I feel like the first man on the sun. I mean, this fucking guy. Is... <laughs> if you told me 10 people were here, I'd believe it. I can't see anything. <laughs> but anyways, these guys, I try jokes on them all the time. And uh, that's kind of what I do. I travel for work and Pam's here, I'm going to pick on her. <laughs> Some of you might know Pam, she's from JC. I did not know Pam until about 10 days ago. I was in Scranton for work in Pramani Brothers Bar next to my hotel, having a beer, and she happens to sit down next to me. And uh, we start bullshitting. And one thing leads to another. From Big Up 10, she laughs, she goes, I'm from JC. I said, I'll talk slower. <laughs> and uh, I started trying jokes out on so she started laughing, and I thought, wow, she's got an infectious laugh. So I told her, why don't you show up? And she did, and she's here with three of her friends, and let's hear from Pam. But anyways, this was the month in hell. I, I went to Houston, I traveled for work, uh, University of Delaware, I went to Maryland. Uh, I bounced around. I gotta tell you about a trip. It was, it was totally the trip from hell. I didn't sleep all night, and uh, I had to fly. I had to fly to Delaware, and I flew into Newark for whatever reason, and I had no sleep. I get to the airport, and there's a delay on my flight, and I'm like, this is awful, because I had it all planned out. I was flying from Albany to Newark, and I'd have like a 45-minute layover. I'd get on a plane, and then I'd sleep all the way, which isn't a long way, but I thought I'd catch a nap. My, my flight got delayed two and a half hours, and I'm like, oh, shit. I'll fall asleep in the airport. I'm going to miss my flight. I can feel it coming on, you know? And as we get older, you worry a lot. <laughs> I call it borrowing worry. I borrowed some worry. And uh, I go, I need something, coffee, something. So I'm thinking, isn't there a coffee out there that's stronger than coffee, like cappuccino or something? So get that if you need to. I'll wait. <laughs> so I'll be with you in a minute. I'm busy. <laughs> I look up and there's a, there's a, you know, it's in the airport, there's a little booth with these girls, young girls running around full energy, probably on their own product, the coffee. And I walked over and, you know, I just turned 60 in January and I'm, I'm an old friend. Like, I always yeah. yeah. So, well, with that comes, you know, you're, I'm a curmudgeon. So, I walk over to the girl and again, I over explain myself. She goes, hi, can I help you? And I'm like, yeah, I'm 60 and I've been up all night. <laughs> I need something that'll keep me awake. And she said, I said, stronger than coffee. She said, honey, I know exactly what you need. This cappuccino. She fills a little glass. She goes, I'm going to promise you right now, you drink this, and you won't fall asleep all night. She goes to hand it to me and spills it on my hand. <laughs> she knew her product. <laughs> I didn't sleep for three days. I had, three, I had a third degree burn on my hand. I'm like, holy shit. So I got, you know, they got me gauze. I filled out an accident report in case I ever sued the coffee hut. And uh, I get on my plane. I show up to the University of Delaware and I get to my hotel room. And I'm actually doing, a, I, I had to do a seminar. And uh, I'm speaking. So I got the gauze on my hand. I get my hotel room and I walk in, close the door and look around. Oh, it looks pretty nice. And I look at the door, and where the jet bolt is, it's blown off the door, and there's blood on it, and there's wood missing where, like, it was forcefully entered. I, I go, holy fuck, like, that, is that a truck rain? I mean, what's going on? So I called down to the front desk, 
the girl answers. And I said, look, man, my room looks like there's a drug raid. And she goes, no, no, there's no. I go, I'm telling you. She says, 402, which I'm sure she saw the RIP or whatever it is. But she also knew something happened there. And uh, I go, never mind, I'll be down in a minute. So I come downstairs and the manager goes, you the guy that called about 402? I was like, yeah. He goes, trust me, there was no drug raid. A guy died in there and we had to get in. <laughs> I go, well, that's a fucking relief. <laughs> For a minute there, I was going to be uncomfortable. <laughs> I'm sleeping in a fucking chalk outline of a dead body. I kind of wished it was a drug deal. I could have bought something. <laughs> that was fucked up. <laughs> so anyways, I told you, I had my birthday. And uh, I have a doctor's appointment. It's like a car hits mileage. I'm 60. Let's get in there. And my doctor says to me, uh, Thank you. We, we exchange pleasantries, we're talking, he says. Uh, he goes, all right, well, look, this is the, you know, the awkward part of the checkup. I need you to take your pants off. I said, well, where do you want me to put them? He said, over there by mine. Fucked <laughs> 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 up, huh? He's an eye doctor. I just went to class. <laughs> That's crazy. I really did go to my doctor, though, and this is, uh, guys, when you do comedy, comedians, you know, I'm in touch with the dark recesses of my mind, and you guys pay me to share them. But you don't, you're not in touch with yours. You're like, I embarrass myself up here because you laugh, and it's just a vicious cycle. I, uh, so I get to the doctor. He, he does a series of tests on me, and he says, he goes, okay, well, let's go over this. He said, uh, you know, I'm going to summarize. I go, what is it? How long do I have? <laughs> he goes, uh, you need to lose weight. And I said, yeah, I don't know. He said, your blood pressure's a little high. He said, your testicles are large. Your good <laughs> cholesterol's good. Your bad cholesterol's good. And I'm like, whoa, wait. Back up a minute. I go, what was that? He goes, do you know the difference between good cholesterol and bad cholesterol? I go, yeah, the other one. He goes, your testicles? I go, yeah. He goes, they're large. I go, is there anything wrong with them? He's like, no. I go, that's fucked up, man. I'm like, I was so mad. So I storm out of there. I get in my car. And I'm an analyzer. I'm like, that's fucked up. So I get in a light and I'm thinking, this guy's been in practice like 30 years and he thought he had to tell me my testicles were large. But I must have some pretty big balls. <laughs> so I'm about halfway home and I come to grips with the fact I'm testicularly enhanced. <laughs> and I'm proud briefly. I'm proud briefly. Until it dawns on me, they're fucking useless. <laughs> and then I'm overanalyzing, like, was my penis small to make that one? <laughs> But they're worthless. It's like getting one walkie-talkie for Christmas. Anybody out there? <laughs> so now you know. And then my friends at Albany now, it's kind of like a mob nickname. They call me Eddie Big Balls. I wish I could I'm going to go on a rant. You know what really bugs me? And if you have one, guys, you bug me. <laughs> Service pets. I get it. I understand that they're important to people. They are important to people. I've seen shit on TV. People got peacocks and so like, what the fuck? I work in retail, so I see them all the time. I mean, how they service you? What do they come with peanut butter? <laughs> That's true. <dirty. laughs> uh, but I mean, they're like, I'm nervous. I gotta bring this dog in with me. I gotta bring this dog, this, you know, whatever, peacock. But I'm like, I, you know what, who doesn't get anxious? You don't see me in a grocery store with a pot plant and a cooler beer going, I'm anxious. <laughs> we all got our ways of dealing with it, but I don't think, uh, I don't think we need to allow these people to drag these pets from. Now I'm going to get serious from it. I wonder if I would, but not about politics. And I know this, in, in the world of comedy, guys, take a deep breath, I'm not going there. Um, <laughs> In the, in the world of politics, in the world of comedy, as it compares to politics, the golden rule is you never bring it up because you split the crowd in half. And I don't think our country's ever been more divided than it is right now. This is a on all of us. But what I want to say is, in my life, I've, there's been 12 presidents in the United States, and I like some, I dislike some, and I got over all of them. You know, here we are hating each other on Facebook, and everybody getting worked up. Get over it. It's coming and going. But that being said, I guess they want to build a wall. You know, like, and I got thinking, they're going to put up a wall that's supposed to keep out all drugs and sex trafficking. 
If that's true, I'll claim that motherfucker. <laughs> I gotta do my shit somewhere. <laughs> I'm the first one. I'll pull all into Mexico. <laughs> I mean, what the fuck is coal? <laughs> Another rant that bothers me. I, I am an old man. I get pissed off. <laughs> but I'm really tired, like, of these millennials that they say that they're going to be the greatest generation ever. And, and I read up on it. They're also the first generation that will have less sex partners than their parents. I don't know what that means. But <laughs> they're, you know what I think of them? They're participation trophy fucks and you know like everybody gets in a little league game you know but when we were kids you waited your turn when you were nine you didn't play when you were ten you played when the game was out of hand when you were eleven and twelve you played these kids get trophies they play they this but you know what I really is missing who the fuck nobody ever dares anybody anymore remember when we were kids we dare you to do shit now it's challenges everything's a challenge you know like we would dare you to do, you know ring the doorbell and run now it's not we're gonna do a challenge. We're gonna do the Tide Pod challenge. We're gonna we're gonna put condoms up our nose. This is our future. You know? That was a new one, and I'm not lying, guys. If you haven't seen it, the kids run away from home for 48 hours. Y'all seen it? To see who can get the most concerned post on social networking. The uh, the runaway challenge for two days. And I got to think. I got an idea. You like challenges? How about a get a job challenge? No. How about get out of the fucking house and get an apartment challenge? How about I sell the house in 48 hours and leave state challenge? <laughs> fucking kids. That's just how I That's not like I'm just buddy at Albany. He's uh he's a civil war buff. And, and uh, he's, uh, I mean, I mean, like, serious. He's, uh, he dresses in all the shit, wears the shoes that could go on either foot. I mean, and, and they sleep outdoors and they eat raw food and whatever. They had this big thing get together, and, and Indiana Tent was coming into town. He needed extra standbys, and he called me. I'm like, hey, you fucking mind. I go, the Civil War was like four years long. You've been doing this for like 14 years. I'm like, who's playing Lincoln? I'll shoot the fucking guy. <laughs> so we can all get back to life, you know? Like, but he says, you never were interested in that. And I go, no, it's fucking stupid. Then I go, yeah, wait a minute. When I went to North High, I was in a Vietnam reenactment group. We used to hide in the woods and smoke pot. <laughs> One day we got all fucked up and we attacked the nail salon. There was Charlie everywhere. That's fucked up. I'm doing some shit right now with some neighbors and uh, I gotta kinda set this up. I live in Cohoes, New York, and you know, holler for the Steve Squaller. Uh, it's uh, on a, it, kind of like the first war. There's a lot of Polish people. And my street's like 500 yards long. It's almost like a bridge. It's all, you know, brownstone stoop type setup. And two houses down from me, there's an elderly couple. And this is deep shit. <laughs> like, these are brother and sister. They've been together. Their parents died. And I, apparently the neighbors all told me that they're two houses down. That when they were children, they grew up in that home. They used to kill pets. Small animals and bury them in the yard. They lived their own pet cemetery. And like pets were turning up this, and I'm talking the 40s, 50s. These people are like 80 now. They're two houses down from me and out of their fucking minds. So I had my grandkids stay over. And I always bring the mattress out to the living room. We all sleep there. We watch, we fight. We, we have a ball. And you'll hear a few of these stories later. But, uh, Welcome, guys. <laughs> so they're, they're sleeping on a mattress, and there's a pounding on my door. It's probably like 1 o'clock in the morning. At the end of this old street, this 500-yard street, there's a Polish-American club that they walk and drink. 
and they fight all the way back, and they got a big rabbit about 30 pounds on a leash. I mean, these are carnies, man. So, and normally I hear them, but I'm hanging out with my grandkids, and we got the TV on, I'm just starting to fall asleep. And she falls on her face, and her husband, her, her, I brought the same thing. <laughs> I think, I think. Uh, he comes up and pounds on my door. I gotta back up a minute. This fucking guy, I parked in front of his house, he kicked my car and put a tent in it. Because I was in front of his house, parked legally, and he was about five feet from where he normally has his car. So I went outside and saw my car. I said, I'll fucking kill you if you ever go to my car again. You won't fuck. So I'm gonna lead up to the story. The guy's dead now. I the cops are gonna question me anything. Because everybody in the neighborhood heard me threatened several times. He comes up to my door, his sister's laying on her face. He pounds on my door. My grandkids jump. I get up. I have a cat. The cat follows me to the door. Open my daughter gave me. So I open the door and he goes, and it's, I don't know that fucking thing's name on uh, the Lord of the Rings, Golem or whatever. He's like, I don't know. So the guy, he's at the door and I'm like, he's talking in tongues. <laughs> she's down, she's down. I go, get the fuck away from my house. And my cat's like, can't we just get a lot of money? Don't, don't get him going, I'll be in the bed. <laughs> so I, I scream at him and I slam the door and lay down. He walks over and stands on a windowsill. My window's about eight feet off the ground and he pounds out of a window unit AC. He pounds on that uh, and that's the foil on it. Like he's pounding and screaming. I came out again my second morning. I'll fucking kill you. Well, fast forward. He died. <laughs> his house is boarded up, and his car still has snow on it. It's really cold. And I'm waiting. The cops are coming, man. I know they're going to question me. <laughs> I've been to Albany now. I don't know. Got it for a long time. And uh, I love it. I mean, it's not Binghamton. This is home. But, uh, you know, I've created a home up there. And I'll tell you, there's a lot more cops. Because, you know, there's a lot more politicians and things are on the street. <laughs> and uh, if I can share a story with it, it's kind of crazy. I, uh, I was getting, that was a Tuesday morning, and I was getting on the Northway at the bottom of the Northway, which is probably the number one DWO roadblock area in probably New York State. You get up there, you can't get out. You, you can't. They got you. And uh, you drive like a quarter mile before you even see cones. So it's Tuesday morning at like probably 8.30. I mean, I, I've been pulling up .04 tops. I mean, Tuesday morning. <laughs> uh, I pull, I'm on the phone with a buddy of mine, and I see the cones. I'm like, oh shit, gotta go, click. Throw the, throw the phone under my seat. I pull up, and the cops wave me over. And they're looking at my inspection sticker, looking in the window. And the cop, there's a young cop and an old cop. The old cop says to me, pull over up ahead. I'm like, why? He said, you were on your cell phone. I said, no, I wasn't. He said, yes, you were. I said, no, I wasn't. He said, we have a guy back there in the woods with binoculars that saw you. I said, I was trying to call you to report suspicious behavior in the woods. So the guy goes, pull over. So I pull over. He gives me the ticket. And I go to traffic court. And the judge laughed out loud, so I think the guy wrote what I said. And I ended up getting, I ended up getting, um, probably like two hundred twenty dollars worth of tickets. And I go to the judge, don't I get a clever discount? I, mean, I think that was kind of funny. It's like pay your right and leave. It's, how many people are having adult beverages tonight? You guys enjoy them? Let's make sure we take care of the the staff here tonight. This is the best. I'm telling you, I'm so proud, Bobby, to bring my friends here and to get treated like they're royalty. Let's make sure we take care of people. But I want to drink responsible and coming from me. That's like Bin Laden being, don't be evil. <laughs> my point is, everybody should know their limits. Okay, and I'm going to tell you a few reasons how, or like how I found out some of mine. Now, when a comedy, the comedian stands up and tells you this is a true story, let me back up a little you know what makes somebody doing comedy relatable? You guys know, especially if you know me, I'm crazy enough to say anything or do anything. So the, the line between fact and fiction is blurred, and I like it that way. But when a comedian says, this really happened, fucker, this really happened. This really happened. I hang out with some of my friends are here with about six, seven guys for the last 15 years in Albany that are called the Wolfpack. 
And we got named the Wolf Pack because we're like the guys on the hangover. We had to wake up in the morning and look at our phones to see what kind of trouble we got in because we didn't remember shit. <laughs> it grew. And there's more and more and a bunch of us. So on Thursday nights, we'd go to a place of tools in Colony up in Albany. And we played trivia. And there's a Wolf Pack. A lot of other people got it. There's a buddy of ours who usually hangs out in the day. His name's Mr. Bob. Mr. Bob's about 77. He fought in Korea. Navy guy. Shitty health, but he likes to hang out. Well, he'd been told by his doctor to quit drinking because he had a bad heart. So this is a fucked up story. We did the trivia night. They play seven rounds. At the end of three, whatever team is in the league gets a full round of drinks for everybody. So at the end of three rounds, the guy goes, I'll tally all the points. And we'll be back in 15 minutes. Whoever has the most gets a free round of drinks. So my buddies were like, let's go out and, and have a cigarette. I used to keep a cigar on a windowsill out there and I light it up and enjoy it. So we go out there, and there's about six or seven very pretty girls, probably in their 40s, 30s. And they come out, and they're smoking cigarettes. And the girl says to me, cigars are gross. And I'm like, I agree. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> girl, good, cigar bad. <laughs> She goes, try this. I thought it was a cigarette thing. It was pot oil. So I took several hits off it. <laughs> Try to fit in and, you know, flirt. I come back in the bar, and all of a sudden, man, holy shit, it was like looking through the wrong side of a keyhole or whatever. It was like, I got myopic, and I'm like, Jesus, this is terrible. So the guy goes, this has never happened before. There's a tie. Uh, the wolf pack and mean girls <laughs> are tied. We need one member from each team to come up to the front. And I had most of our right answers. They're like, get up there, get up there. <laughs> so I walk up there and I get to the thing, and there's no microphone. So the guy has a laptop and he's got a question in there and he's got a little bell. And I'm hired a draft pussy. <laughs> so I walk up and I, you know, I'm trying to get my bearings. And he goes, okay, this is how it's going to work. I'm going to give a question. It's like family feud. Whoever hits the bell gets the answer. If they're wrong, the other person gets the answer. He goes, you guys got it? I go, I just have one question. He said, yeah. I said, what if she gets it wrong? He goes, well, like I said, she gets it wrong, you get to go. I got it, got it. I'm standing there, and he says, and on, in the show Gilgan's Island, that's the last fucking thing I heard. I was like, I love that show. <laughs> I'm like... Why did the Howls bring so much clothing when it was a three-hour tour? Like, why did the professor make a radio out of a coconut, but he couldn't patch the fucking boat? Like, I'm analyzing, and all of a sudden, I snapped out of it. I snapped out of it, and I said, could you repeat the question? He goes, it's already over. The girls are drinking. I'm like, so, guys, this gets worse. I come back to my table. They go, how'd you do? I go, I love Gilgan's Island. So we didn't, get the, we didn't get the drinks. So they're all yelling at me, and I go, I got to go to the bathroom and wash my face. Like, I'm tripping balls here. <laughs> so I go in the bathroom. I go to the bathroom. I wash my hands. I splash my face. I'm looking. I go, yeah, I look pretty good. I'm all right. I think I can get by. I'm like, I open the door. And Mr. The guys, don't hate. This is fucking evils of drugs. I open the door, and Mr. Bob's on the ground. He had a heart attack. Don't go getting soft on me. <laughs> you know what went through my mind? I do not need this in my life right now. <laughs> so he's laying on the ground. And when I said this is true, this is fucking true. Bob's a little portly, so I had to kind of, I almost yodeled when I reached the top. I'm trying to get over him. And he goes, he came too right when I was on. He goes, Ed, he's got my shoelace. I go, look, man. I go, I'm Gilgan's Island High. <laughs> like, I, I go, let me go get help. He's like, help me, help me. I go, I barely got out of high school. <laughs> I mean, let me go get somebody more qualified. So I'm on my way to the bar, and I see a guy I haven't seen in like 15 years. And he goes, Eddie, how you doing? I go, how are you doing? He hugs me. Let's go get a beer. And I fucking forgot about Bob. <laughs> so I go to the bar. I get my beer, and we're laughing. And a girl comes out of the girls' room, sees Bob on the ground, and lets out a scream. The whole bar looks. I go, oh, yeah, Bob had a heart attack in the bathroom. <laughs> and 
and they all run to the back of the bar, and I'm sitting there alone going, that can't look good. I mean, that's fucked up. So I, uh, I went back there trying to fit in. I tried to get them help. I called 912. They never answer. Okay. They're never staffed. But you can hear it. I felt like Ralphie with the Red Rider BB gun when the, kid's, when the kid's tongue was on the pole and he heard the siren. I was like, you can hear the sirens coming. Everybody's looking at me. I mean, wait, fucking look at me. He looked good when I left him. He had good color. <laughs> Truth be known, he's bluer than a goddamn porpoise. I, uh, that's a, you know, I always get a kick out. You ever watch 911 or you hear recordings on, on, on TV? I don't know what the criteria is to get that job. You would think you'd need some compassion and a sense of urgency. But, like, I, people go, you know, they answer the phone, like, calculate, like, 911, what's your emergency? And the lady's screaming, oh, my God, my husband's been decapitated. Oh. Calm down, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> Are his eyes open? Yes. Look him in the eye and tell him we got help coming on the way, but traffic's a bitch. <laughs> or you call suicide hotline, they put you on hold and play Van Halen's jump. <laughs> Go ahead and jump. <laughs> They're not professionals. <laughs> Talked a little bit earlier about doctors. I... Uh, this story is another one of these embarrassing ones that if I don't share, you don't laugh. But uh, I have two children. They're, uh, <laughs> I'm going to make an asshole out of myself. They're, they're old. I don't know. They're <laughs> I, uh, but when my second kid was born, my wife said to me, the minute we have that second kid, you're having a vasectomy. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah, man. You put out a family. The least I can do is do that. You know, I owe you that. But I didn't know, like, the minute. Like, she fucking had an appointment. Like, you know, when your kid's born, you don't sleep much. I mean, you're there through the whole thing. That labor was hell on me, girls. I, uh, I, uh, but then you go drinking and celebrate with your buddies. And next thing you know, you got a doctor's appointment to get snipped. So, and I am analytical. And this is before you could look it up on the Google. So I didn't know what the hell I was getting into. But I was scared. So I went to my doctor. The first thing you do is you have a consultation visit. You sure you want to do this? I'm going to tell you guys more than you need to know about vasectomies, I promise you. <laughs> I won't be too graphic, but you got to understand what I went through. Uh, so the doctor tells me, you have two tubes coming down through here. One has semen, which is the river, and one has sperm, which is the fish. I'm going to cut the fish one and burn it so all you have is river. Well, okay, okay. So I go, I get all that. Let's back up a minute. Where are you cutting me? Like, how's this start? Well, we're going to make a small incision on your testicles. I said, okay, but we'll stop right there. That's almost like getting your eyeball cut. I'm like, no. I go, so how do I know I won't feel it? We're going to apply a numbing agent. I go, what form? Well, I'm going to give you a shot. I go, in my balls? He goes, yeah. I'm like, that's where I'm having a problem. I said, I can't get, he goes, have you ever been stung by a bee? I go, not in the balls. I'm like, but I got to tell you, it was very easy. The surgery was the easiest thing. I mean, looking back on it, I probably could have done it if I wanted to. <laughs> Especially with the internet and all. I would. But I, uh, so it, it took him, it took him minutes. It, real quick, he did it. And uh, I came for my next appointment. Now, this will sound boastful. I don't mean it to be. Apparently, my, my sperm count was so high that I had reservations in me that you got to, it's got to all be out of you before they give you a clean bit of health. And this is long enough ago that they did things a little differently. So I go to the doctor and they go, here's a cup. You need to go into that room over there and there's magazines in there. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Are you kidding me? So I go in there and I got the cup. I called it the deposit closet. I, uh, but it was, it was like partitioned off. It didn't have a roof. People are walking down. I heard a filing cabinet close my dick. Like, <laughs> it's like, but my sperm count was so high that I got to know them. I kept coming back. By the sixth, seventh time, I'm like, who left these magazines? You know I like Asians. <laughs> and that's in the hallway with my pants down. Like, uh, can a brother get a Wi-Fi password? <laughs> that happened, and that's, that was awful. You know, I went to lunch with my daughter the other day, and God, she's precious, and she gets real excited about me doing shows and says, 
why don't you tell the story about my prom night? And I'm like, oh, this show's going to be hours long if you keep adding. But her junior prom, she, uh, she went out. We, I went to this house. The kid she went with was, their, their parents were loaded, man. Beautiful home, and they took great pictures and everything. And for whatever reason, they decided the after party be at my shack. And uh, she calls me. I'm watching basketball game, drinking beer. I'm probably three, four beers in there. Eh, maybe a little more, if I'm honest. But if you took the back roads, I'm a mile from the grocery store. So I go, yeah, they can come over. I said, but everybody's staying over. Nobody's driving. You know the rules. But nobody's drinking, blah, 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 blah. I said, what do you want? Well, snacks, treats. We're going to play music. We're going to dance. You're going to go to your room. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Guess I've been bad. So I go to the grocery store, and uh, I'm buying a bunch of shit for her. And, I, and out of nowhere, this is part of getting older. You know, you could like, you know, sneeze and shit your pants. I mean, gravity really takes over with waste when you're older. I'm like, I gotta pee, like out of nowhere. There was no warning or anything. So I go, can I use the bathroom? They go, no, we're waxing it. I'm like, you're fucking kidding me. So I, I didn't even buy all the shit because I knew I, I had a decision to make. <laughs> so I get in my car, I race down the road, I hang a right and I go down the backwoods that go straight to my driveway in this side street. And I have to piss so bad, I'm in agony. So I pull over. It's about 11 o'clock at night. It's a little neighborhood. Nobody's around. I'm holding on the door, peeing in the road. And I feel my fingers being pried. The car's in drive. <laughs> Guys, I am not lying. The door closed and locked. And the car, and the car took off. Did I add in it was a company car? <laughs> Uh, the car took off. Now, as luck would have it, it was a slight incline. The car's going like a mile an hour. And, uh, and I'm running alongside it. I'm, did I piss my pants? Oh, fuck it. All I'm like, I'm not even religious. And I'm like, please, God, let me out of this and I'll never piss again. <laughs> I'm going to drink, though. <laughs> so I chase the car and, and I'm, I'm exhausted. You probably can't tell, but I'm not athletic at this point. <laughs> so I'm running alongside the car, and I'm, I'm resting, waiting for it to get to me, and I'm winding up and punching the window. Broke my hand. The car went over a mailbox, through a garden, hit a tree, and the fucking motion lights went on. I ran up to it, grabbed a brick out of the garden, smashed the window, dove in the car, cut myself from my chin to my belt, tore all my clothes, my hair's in the air, got piss all over me. There's... <laughs> Blood and glass in the groceries. And I get to the house, and the kids are dancing. And my daughter's like, what the hell happened to you? I go, you're not going to believe the fucking line at the grocery store. <laughs> that happened. That happened. As I get older, I'm uh, not only am I kind of a little curmudgeonish, if that's a word, but I also get paranoid. Like, I put, like, tape on my TV and, and, and computer so the fucking government can't watch. Well, what the fuck they want to watch me for? I don't know, but it bothers me. This is a crazy story, but kind of shine a light on how paranoid I'm getting. My uh, ex-wife came into Albany for business, and I was in Pittsburgh. And she called me and said, do you mind if I stay at your house? Kind of sounds unconventional most, I'm sure. <laughs> We've got a successful co-parenting arrangement. So I'm like, yeah, stay at my house. So she stays at the house. She leaves two days before I get back, and I get there. And uh, she put, like, candles all over. And remember, I'm paranoid now, so I'm like, well, do I stink? Like, what the fuck is she doing here? <laughs> so the place kind of don't look like I left it, you know? And uh, so I'm walking by the bookcase, and I hear, Shh. I'm like, what the fuck was that? <laughs> I, I walk by again, Shh. and I'm like, I said, holy shit. So I call my daughter. I said, Marissa, I go, did you talk to your mom when she was here? She goes, yeah. She goes, was she, I said, was she acting weird? She goes, she's always weird. I go, no, like weird, weird. She goes, what are you getting at? I said, I think she's filming me. She goes, you're like so seven guys ago. Like, why the fuck would she film you? I said, she's filming me. So I said, come over tomorrow, I'll show you. So she comes over, and guys, I'm so fucking paranoid. I was sitting off to the angle watching my TV like this so I wouldn't get near the camera. 
my daughter came in. I said, careful, I think it's motion activated. It goes, Shh. I go, there it is. She goes, you mean that electric Febreze thing she put up there? And I said, the point I'm trying to make is your mother hasn't been herself lately. Uh, that's fucking paranoid. When I was a kid growing up, I, this is something kind of cool. My initials are my name. It used to be cool. E.D. I don't know what happened with that. I, uh, my friends would go, Ed, D, Eddie, E.D., Ed. I was like, yeah, that's right. Shit's interchangeable. That's me. Then some scientist decided impotence needed a name, came up with erectile dysfunction, <laughs> which apparently is too long a word to say. So now it's ED. And I'm no longer proud. I go to reunions. I'm the laughing stock. But I'm going to put it out there. It could have been you, Norty. How about Bob, barely operating boner? How about Tim, totally immobile meat? How about Pat, penis altitude trouble? It could have been you is all I'm saying. Here's something that bothers me, computers. You know, getting on them and uh, last time I was in town, I talked about them a little bit. But when you go on a computer, this drives me crazy. Um, I did a paper for my daughter. A lot of you are probably going, well, what's she trying to fail? Uh, <laughs> She's busy with two kids, got her degree, and I helped her out. I got 96 on a paper and it lowered her, G, her grade point average, and she yelled at me. But it was on the Erie Canal was part of it. And I go into my computer, and I put Erie Canal, and it says, did you mean anal? <laughs> <I'm le> <laughs> Not when I started, but... <laughs> Seven hours later, I woke up on the floor with my pants to my ankles, dehydrated. I don't know what the fuck happened there. <laughs> it happened to me again. It happened to me again. I buy Russian hockey jerseys. I think the uh, Heidi hockey fans, the Red Army was the best hockey team ever. So I collect jerseys. So I go on that fucking computer again. I put Russian hockey. He said, you mean Russian hooker? I'm like, <laughs> pow. My fucking computer goes white. Warning, warning. You entered a child porn site. You need to send money to Homeland Security. And I was like, so like any, you know, adult, I unplugged my computer and pointed towards the wall. <laughs> Fuck it. And ignored it for about a week. Then I walked by and I'm like, you know, I kind of need this shit for work. And then I thought, wait a minute. That fucking Homeland Security don't care if I'm horny. I'm going to call them. That's what I'm going to do. So I called him, get through all the red tape. Guy's like, Homeland Security. I said, yeah, I'm a purveyor of Russian artifacts. He goes, oh, you got on a Russian hooker site and got froze, huh? I'm like, he says, hold on. He transferred me to the I can't fucking believe you fell for it department. And that guy gets on the phone and says, you, you did nothing wrong. You don't owe anybody money. Here's the code to get it back on. I said, okay. And uh, I got it back on. I said, good, I need to get more Russian hockey jerseys. And uh, about six months later, I did a show in Cleveland, and my son came to it. He goes to school in Kent State. And I told that story. And uh, about six months after that, he called me and wanted to know if I still had the code. <laughs> so I come from a long line of masturbators. It's like, it's like a family business. It's recession-proof. Business is good. But I'm proud of them. Last time I told this joke, I watched the video afterwards and I could hear people, you could hear people squirming. <laughs> Fuck it, I'm going to tell it. I, uh, I told you earlier, I love my grandkids and we have sleepovers twice a month and uh, I decided to try something different. I said, you know what I'm going to do? We like to play hide go seek. I'm going to put black lights throughout my place and then when the lights go down, I'm like, boo! Y'all remember that shit when you were hiring kids? <laughs> shit got blue, man. Everything lighted. So I did it. So they're going, what are we doing, Poppy? What are we doing? I said, we're going to play I Go Seek. And I go, let's play. I said, no, we're going to wait a minute. I said, I got a new twist here. Uh, sun goes down. I said, you ready? They're like, yeah. I'm like, click, poo. 
They're like, oh, they're on and on. I'm on and on. Why I'm on and on, I look, and they're staring at me. That fucking dandruff. You, know, you can see some shit with those black lights. You're like, they're staring at me. And then I look down, and I've dusted it off. While I did that, they ran to my room. I'm like, no. <laughs> Holy shit. That DNA factory? Are you fucking kidding me? By the time I caught them, it was too late. They looked like the girl on Poltergeist. They're just fucking... It looked like Roberson's planetarium. Like, hey, look, the Big Dipper. I'm like, I did some shit in here. Right? Why I'm doing that, my grandson goes, look, Poppy, an electric eel. I go, get away from that tube sock. <laughs> Fucked up shit. <laughs> you guys are sick. <laughs> How many people here went to Ben Franklin? Oh, man. Uh, how about Coolidge, St. Paul's? Yeah, they're all the same. We all got, boy, you know what I mean? We all went through the same shit. But I went to Franklin. Last time I was in town, I got in there, and I'm walking around. I'm like, holy shit, like the water fountains are here, the little stool to stand on. Everything looks so small. And I go down the hall, and I see the principal's office, and I was like, Jesus, how do we get anything done in here? Me, him, his secretary? Like I was in the principal's office every fucking day. Oh, you laugh. Try writing on the board a thousand times. I won't whip my dick out on the playground with no elbow room. <laughs> like, I'm like, I'm gonna... But I remember, what I remember most about Ben Franklin is the, the, the air raid drills during the Cold War. I guess the Russians were after that scholar-infested academy. <laughs> so they'd march us downstairs. I'm seven years old. And it, it, they even had, remember the yellow and black air raid signs as you're going down the I was like, geez, why are they mad at us? So I got down there and we get under our desk, coat over your head. At seven years old, I fucking knew that wasn't gonna help. <laughs> like I was like, <laughs> if they blow up this building and bricks, mortar, and everything lands on me, and the only thing between me and sure death is my Philadelphia sales rain slicker and a fucking <laughs> I'm fucking toast. At that point all I could hope for was an open casket. How many people went to East Junior? I often say this. I went to, I served eight months in East Junior Correctional Facility. <laughs> that was, now first of all, they got, I got to back up a minute. In Binghamton, and you guys all get this, we had January and June grads. Like, were we that bustling in the community? Like, what the fuck was that all about? <laughs> so, a lot of people in this room with me, we were in school together at East, and we got to North, and they pulled us in the auditorium and said, you got a decision to make. You can stay here for three and a half years or four and a half years. You remember some of you? And uh, I chose four and a half because I was going to be a college and all-star football player. <laughs> I, I, it's all right to have plans. I, uh, but I, I actually only ended up there for three terms. Uh, Fords, Carters, <laughs> Nixons. I, I didn't do good in high school. I, I struggled. I graduated third from the bottom of my class. And uh, I, I was a late bloomer. You, if you, you know why I was doing what I'm doing tonight all through high school? Just being an asshole. But uh, when, I, when I went to East Junior, it was at such a tough time because they got rid of the January and June grads during the summer. So they were like, everybody's got to go. I'm sorry, in winter, January. We had to bus from my neighborhood where I walked two blocks to school and I had to hop on a bus, and I had to go to school, which at the time, for those of you who've been around, East Junior had a lot of racial tension when we were heading over there in the early 70s. There was a lot of fights, and I jokingly said it, that wasn't a school, it was a prison. You know, they had gangs, they had shitty food, unsolicited sex. Sorry, girls. <laughs> uh, it was a fucked up school. But it, it's also when you start getting naked in the showers with your classmates. So. I'm, I'm going to school with, you know, racially mixed school, and I don't want to stereotype, but I'm Irish. They're not. <laughs> My first gym class, I was, uh, man, I was like stressing. I was like, how am I going to pull this off? I was, I was kind of surprised to see it was segregated like the lunchroom. The brothers were on one side of the shower, and the white guys were on the other. I said, I can handle this, so I kind of grabbed my shit, and I tiptoed past them. 
I look up and there's a couple Asians in the corner shower. I'm like, Eureka, I'm gonna go over there. So I went over there and I'm soaping up like a fucking porn star. And they start talking about math. I'm like, uh oh, back over to the brothers. <laughs> I had to get out of there. I didn't fit in with either of them. So I, I usually start off my show with this, but I, you know, I put it on the back end. When I pull into town, I do, I, I do the same thing every time. I like to drive around and trigger thoughts and memories. And a lot of times I put a lot of work into what I want to talk about and it goes away. The minute I see you guys or I see stuff in town and I'm like, wow, man, I got so many memories I want to touch on. But uh, the first thing I do is go to the cemetery and I see my parents' grave. And then on the other side, uh, I don't know if other families do this, but my parents are on one side, my grandparents are on the other. Kind of, that's got a four for two deal. But <laughs> so... I go to my parents' grave, and then I come around to my grandparents' grave. And it's kind of emotional, but I'll share it with you. I, I actually was with my grandfather the day he passed away. And I'll never forget the words, his last words to me. Stop shaking the ladder, you little bastard. <laughs> <laughs> and it kind of sucked, you know. <laughs> He's a pitcher of health. He just came from the doctors. I remember walking in on my grandparents making love. I still won't eat raisins. It was fucking, oh. it was awful. Awful. <laughs> this, this, this next subject is probably the closest to my heart, and that's 45 Jackson Street that I grew up. And uh, I talked about it last time I was here. The Munster's house ain't got shit on this place. It's like, <laughs> it's fucking haunted, man, haunted. But what I do is I like to light up a cigar and sit outside my house and just stare at the windows and, and remember stuff. And I'm going to back up a minute. Right across the street from my house is Webster Street Park, or Southside Park, as we all grew to know it. And uh, that was a special place for me. I mean, there's a saying that you learn more in the first five years of your life than you will the rest of your life combined. I'm sure there's some truth to that. You walk, you talk, you eat, you swallow, you whatever. But I would argue between 12 and 17, I learned a lot of shit at Southside Park. <laughs> I learned how to drink, smoke pot, have sex, fight, steal, what did I name it? Uh, other than that, it's a special place. It's, uh, I, uh, I made up my mind. When I go back to Albany, I'm going to have my attorney put a clause in my will. When I die, I'm going to have my remains scattered at Southside Park. I made that up today. But I'm not going to be cremated. Just an arm over here, a leg over here. My ball's in the sandbox. For the cats. What I'm trying to say is I think it's important to get back to your community. But I remember one time when I was young, my mom opened the door on me, pleasuring myself. I go, Mom, close that door. She said, not till you get in this house. <laughs> so I can see why my neighbors kind of hated me. But I, <laughs> I'm, sitting outside, I'm sitting outside my house, and I'm looking at the windows. And I, I talk to, about this every time I'm in town. My dad was a cop. He was a Marine, fought in World War II. I, I half-jokingly call him Mr. Warmth. I don't think, you know... He was from that era where kids are to be seen, not heard, and, you know, he beat my ass quite a bit, and I know I earned it. But uh, every time I look at that house, I think about something. I remember one day he told me I was useless. And, like, I always mouthed off. I go, useless? I can think of ten families in this neighborhood alone that use me as a bad example. <laughs> and he fucking hit me. <laughs> like, then I looked in the window where I shared a uh, bunk bed with my brother Brian, and... Uh, he had the top back bunk and pissed the bed every night, so I think you know where we're going with this. I, uh, I didn't wear pajamas. I wore like rain slicker, like a longshoreman. I was uh, hunkering down. And uh, one night I'm fighting through a storm. <laughs> and and I, I, I saw a monster. And uh, I screamed. And Probably was a bathrobe or something, but I was a monster for a seven-year-old kid. And uh, Mr. Warmth got up. Oh, he came in the room. He's like, shut up. What's going on? I said, there's a monster in the room. God damn it, there's no such thing as monsters. Get to bed. He went back in his room. I go, eh, there isn't this room. <laughs> About an hour later, I started dreaming again. Thought I saw the monster. I started screaming. My father came back in. He's like, I thought I told you there's no such thing. So he grabs me by the neck, makes me go through the closet, through the dresser drawers, under the bed. Now, get the bed. There's no monster. 
see the master again. I knew I wasn't going to wake up Mr. Warmth. I mean, his reasoning was getting more aggressive with each visit. I, uh, so I crawled into my parents' room and got under the bed where I thought I'd be safe. I'm seven years old. I go, how could anything happen to me here? My parents are with me. And they didn't dust much. They had a hardwood floor. I learned that when I got out. I had like a fucking rabbit on the back of my head. But I, uh, I'm laying under there, happy as a clam, sleeping. And my parents engaged in adult activity while I'm under the bed. I figured the monster found me and was fucking furious. I, I, I could tell by the noises. He was fucking mad. Hey. A couple minutes later, I don't know, by, by my mom, somebody's like, I'm coming, I'm coming. I'm like, it's about goddamn time. The monster's been in my room for like four hours. <laughs> then I looked in the upstairs window. Oh. I uh, discovered my sexuality at 12 years old in a bathtub, the same one you used, Mary Catherine. <laughs> um, <laughs> At the second floor of 45 Jackson Street, I only tell you because if you buy the house, it's previously used. <laughs> Anyways, I'm in the bathtub, washing a part of my body faster than I ever had before. And I got to be honest, I didn't know what I stumbled onto, but I was all in. <laughs> so I'm scrubbing the shit out of it. And my mother barges in. She says, Edward, cut that out or you'll go blind. Y'all remember that myth, right? And I don't blame her for barging in. It probably sounded like I was pulling water skiers. There's fucking water up on the wall. <laughs> a couple minutes later, Mr. Warp barges in. He said, God damn it, you heard your mother cut it out. You go blind. I said, Dad, I'm over here. <laughs> <laughs> I come from a long line of masturbators. <laughs> <laughs> That's sick. Yeah. Mary Catherine, don't tell anyone else. I, uh, in the family that I'm picking. I, I, a minute ago, I alluded, or a while ago, I alluded to my friends in Albany and the, the, you know, the influence all of us have on each other, and you kind of form each other's sense of humor. But I got my buddy Ernie here. I got to tell a little story about. Ernie is, uh, and I've been given the guidelines. Uh, <laughs> let's just say he's involved in a, fr used to be involved in a fraternal organization that likes motorcycles and wears leather. We'll leave it at that. Um, but I always like him and I would hang out together and he's my boy, but I would say to him, I'm going to go down to the clubhouse and knock over some fucking bikes and unplug your jukebox. And he goes, fucking go down. Let's go. I'll take you down right now. I go, no, I'll go when I want to go and fucking knock those bikes over. <laughs> so one day him and I are sitting at the bar and the room starts getting dark. I'm like, what the fuck? I turn around and there's about 10 bikers in leather. <laughs> like, Surrounding me. And Ernie says, tell him about the jukebox. I'm like, the fuck? I'm like, Come on, funny guy. Tell him about the jukebox. I'm like, what are you, Ernie, what are you doing? And then he started laughing, and they all laughed, and they bought me a drink. But for a minute there, well, I'm cured. I don't fucking talk about it anymore. But, so got a heart of gold. He's getting his house torn apart so his young daughter and her husband and baby can have his house. And they're building an apartment above. And this poor guy's sleeping in, you know, with sheetrock being torn apart. And now he's staying at my house for a little bit. And uh, so he's in my house. And, you know, <laughs> we're both Oscar. There's no Felix. I, uh, <laughs> he likes the Bruins, and I like the Rangers. And they, they played the other night in a game. And the Bruins were ahead 3-1. to one. And he gets up early. He goes, I'm going to bed. I'll see what happened in the morning. And I said, Okay. So about five minutes later, the Rangers scored. I go, they scored, it's three to two. He's like, I said, I'll, I'll see what happened in the morning. I'm like, okay. Rangers scored again. I go, they fucking scored again. He said, I said, I'll, I'll check it out in the morning. We're yelling through a wall. And I said, you'll find out in the morning when you wake up with a penis drawn on your forehead with a Sharpie. He goes, I'll fucking stab you. I'm like, oh, fuck it. Hey, I could hear him snoring through the wall while I was like this all fucking night. I know he wouldn't have. Then we had a snowstorm, and uh, our cars get covered. And this is the street in him. He's the street kid. He goes, do you have a shovel? His daughter had a baby the day before, and he goes, i got to get to the hospital. I said, yeah, i got a shovel. i got a red one. So I opened out in the hallway, I opened the door in the closet, 
And I see a little black one. I was like, oh, fuck. I, I don't know. So I give it to him. He goes out and, you know, it's like trying to shovel 12 inches of snow with a teaspoon. <laughs> and I go, and I figured by the time he get done, I'll go get my car. So I'm looking for my scarf and gloves and everything. I'm rummaging through the closet. You can tell. I said we were Oscar. I'm looking for it. And there's the shiny red shovel. It's like fucking five times the size of his shovel. And I'm like, I'm going to make him look like an idiot. So I get my scarf, my hood, my hat, my boots, my gloves. I normally never have all that shit in one city. But I put it all on, and I go out, and I go, Ernie, look. Trying to, you know, one-up him. And there's a young kid with a snowblower cleaning his car off. And blowing the snow on my car. So the, the kid goes, are you happy? Ernie goes, yeah. Ernie goes, you got 10 bucks you could give him? I give the kid 10 bucks, and Ernie drives away. I'm like, what the fuck? And I go, what about my car? The kid's like, do you got 10 more dollars? I'm like, oh, fuck it. That's fucked up. It's fucked up. How many of you know Tommy Hannigan? Yeah, quite a bit. Critter. Tommy, uh, it's funny. Whenever I'm getting ready to do a show, my friends are always like, hey, can you tell that story about me and this? But Tommy Hannigan's fucking funny. I mean, the shit we've been through. Last time I started to talk about it, in the early 90s, I, uh, I started selling life insurance. And uh, they told us, that, you know, here's the pie charts. Tell them how rich they're going to be. And, you know, so they said, get a hold of your, write down who you'd go in a foxhole with because that's who we're going to get money from first. So Tommy's at the top, best man in each other's wedding. Uh, how'd that pan out? We're both divorced. But I, uh, <laughs> I... I called him up, and he says, yeah, come on over. So he liked to smoke pot at the time, so I don't know if he thought he was dying. He wanted some life insurance. So I said, I want him to show him a charge. He says, so tell me, what's this life insurance all about? I said, I didn't, I didn't go to all the training, but I think I can handle this. You're going to fucking die. Someone else is getting money. And, uh, so he says, give me $200,000 of whole life, because then it's like a retirement plan. I was like, holy shit. Yeah, $200,000. So I write up the contract. I go to work the next day. I'm fucking skipping in that fucking office. This is my first policy. I walk up to the girl that runs the office. I'm like, bam, set that shit up. She's like, $200,000 is a lot of money. I said, you're goddamn right it is. She goes, he's going to need a drug test. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Trivia, IQ test, anything. I'm fucking... He'd do better in calculus. <laughs> so the nurse calls him and says, are you going to be home Monday morning? I'll swing by. He says, yeah. So he says to me, calls me up. He said, hey, the nurse called me. I got an appointment for Monday morning. And I'm like, yeah, I know. I've been losing sleep over it. And he says, well, here's how this is going to go down if you want your money. See, you're going to get up early Monday morning, come to my house, hide in the shower, and when she gives me the cup, I'm going to come in and you're going to piss in it. I'm like, God. I go, you're out of your fucking mind. Like, I'm the state license. Like, I'm going to prison. Like, I was, I was brand fucking new in my job. And he goes, I'll never forget what he said. <laughs> fucking funny. He goes, no tink, no ink. You're <laughs> not going to sign it if I don't piss. I was so fucking mad. Anyway, I get up early on Monday. <laughs> I go to his house. Hide in the shower. I'm sure I could have pissed if I wasn't so fucking scared. <laughs> I needed pepper and tweezers. When I sneezed, I grabbed my dick when it popped out. <laughs> I peed in the cup. And he passed. Well, I might have surprised some of you, but he passed. He, uh, so he says to me, he calls me up. Well, she called me. I said, what happened, what happened? You know, I've been taking my jobs online. He said, I passed. I said, you mean I passed? He goes, we passed. <laughs> I go, what else did she say? He said, well, she rambled on about a few things and said, I was the calmest person that ever heard they had AIDS. I'm like, what? You fucking kidding me? <laughs> and then he laughed and hung up on me. <laughs> fucking guy. That's a true story. Here's, here's another one that, man, I, I can't believe I'm alive, like the shit we used to do. But... Uh, we, I went out one night in like 1987 at Chi Chi's over by the mall. They just had, remember Chi Chi's? Do you remember the welded bowl they had in the, the vestibule out there? 
Well, I got fucked up, took it and put it in my trunk and drove off <laughs> in a snowstorm. I found out on the news it was worth like $15,000. But, so I took it to, I don't, what, what was like up on Vestal Parkway on the hill by Channel 40? Wasn't there like a dance bar there or something? Power and Light. So, and I'm not, earlier I'm not a dancer other than I came on Eileen. But I, 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 brought, I brought the bull to the bar and we got it on the dance floor and we were spinning it and jumping over it. This thing's fucking worth money. We didn't know. And uh, so it was about three in the morning the, the, bar, the owner threw us out. And I'm like, what the fuck am I going to do with the bull? You know, so <laughs> my former boss, Anthony, this is going to be news to you. I, uh, I had the keys to the Vestal Dicks and I went in there. I was his assistant. And I brought the bull downstairs and I... They had aisles where all the back stock wasn't in the last aisle. I put the bull and I put tarp over it. The next day, Anthony's off. Ed Stack, the CEO of Dick's now, was the CEO of Dick's then. <laughs> Much smaller. He, uh, he came in the store and he goes, let's take a look at the store. We're going on a tour. So we're walking and he goes, let's look downstairs. I'm like, oh. So he's going down the aisles. Yeah, that looks good. You should get that out on the floor. Yeah, that. Well, that's kind of over full. And we're like one aisle away from the bull. And I said, Eddie, stop a minute. I said, the craziest thing happened to me last night. I said, I went to the Power and Light, and I saw people dancing on the dance floor with a, a sculpted bull. And I took it from him because I know the guy runs Chi-Chi's. He goes, I saw that on the news. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Are you kidding me? So I was like, holy shit, he's going to see it in a minute for fucking real. He goes, what'd you, what'd you do with it? I go, come here. I fucking, it's like, you got to get that out of here. So here's where Tommy Hannigan comes in. <laughs> I fucking, I called Tommy and I said, listen, you need to help me and you don't need to fucking veer anywhere away from the directions. I said, this guy knows I have the bowl. If you do something stupid and it ends up in the paper, I'm fucked. I go, so I call Chi Chi's. I go, I need the general manager. The guy answers. This is Joe. I say, hey, Joe, you general manager? Yeah. I said, this is about an amnesty deal. I said, I got the bowl. I'm going to drop it off. Any funny business, the bowl gets it. And the guy goes, hold on. The state troopers are here right now. I'm like, fuck it. So I hung up. So I called Tommy and I said, this is what you got to do. You got a truck, put the bull in it, go to the cemetery, Calvary, put it next to the fence, behind Chi Chi's, call me when you're done, pre-cell phone days. So that was like, there was a lot of time between steps. I said, call me and I'll call Chi Chi's and I'll hang up on them quick so they can't trace it. See, I watch a lot of TV. And uh, I said, call me when you're done. Hour goes by, two hours. He fucking calls me, said, mission accomplished. <laughs> Last guy said that was George Bush. <laughs> the war wasn't over. But mission accomplished. I said, awesome. Did you put it in a cemetery? He goes, well, I put it where bulls go. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? They had a real bull at the Vestal Steakhouse inside of a bullpen for a promotion, and he put the bull in with it. The next day in the paper, they got the bull sniffing the statue with people taking pictures. And Ed Stack said, I think another bull got taken. <laughs> I'm like, fucking. <laughs> got away with that one. I, uh, last time I was here, I was talking about one of my favorite holidays is Halloween. And uh, Amen. great holiday, great time of year. But growing up in Binghamton, especially South Side, one of the things I always thought was weird is like people go out like the day before beggars night. <laughs> like, they're like, like you could tell somebody's social economic standing by how early their kids trick or treated. You know, like, <laughs> like the bailos would be out in September. You know, like fucking <laughs> people were out early. I remember one Halloween, I'm sitting on the bed in my costume. My mom comes up and goes. Why are you sitting there pouting? I said, you know, I don't like Halloween. She said, you got your costume on. You love Halloween. Aren't you going out? I go, no. She said, why? I said, I got fear of heights. She said, there's no tall buildings on the south side. I said, Saratoga Heights, motherfucker. Like, oh, those kids took that shit serious. Like, they're out there looking for groceries. Like, like, 
They wanted a razor in the apple so their mother could shave. <laughs> Scraping soap off windows. They took that shit serious. I'll never forget one prank I pulled on the arena. I, uh, I remember the lady's name was Sturvin. Older lady, lived alone. And you all remember the dog shit in the bag deal where you light it on fire, ring the doorbell, the people, unsuspecting fool comes out and gets shit all over. All right, so I light the bag on fire and uh, hid behind the bushes and giggled and giggled and giggled until the door caught on fire. Now, I just thought she wasn't home. I didn't know she couldn't hear. But she sure the fuck heard me stomping on the dog shit and getting it all over me. And here's the funny part. She opened the door and gave me a candy bar and told me I was a dead ringer for Howdy Doody. So I, fucking, I didn't even have a costume on. I was like, what the fuck? I still love Halloween, though. But I sit there and I think about all my birthdays. I just had one January 2nd, my 60th, and I was like, wow. You know? But thank you, guys. Thank you. Hey. Sorry for all you that took the under. <laughs> I'm surprised too. I lost money. I, uh, so I, I'm sitting there and I'm like, and I'm going to share this with you. I had one birthday party in my life and I'm, you know, I'm scarred. <laughs> I'm all right. I don't need counseling. But I was, uh, so when I turned 60, I'm thinking of all my birthdays. I was seven years old and my grandfather says to me, and we didn't really have much birthday parties and shit that I remember. But my grandfather goes, what do you want for your birthday? And I said, a switchblade. <laughs> I, I just had seen West Side Story, and I was a punk in waiting. So I, uh, he goes, a switchblade? Like, he left disgusted. My birthday rolls around, and uh, I get gifts. I'm rifling through them, you know, like Ralphie with the Red Rider BB gun. And I second Ralphie reference. I'm, like, fucking throwing shit, like underwear, socks. I'm seven, eight. So... I goes, that it? Anybody got anything else? You know, like, I want that fucking switchblade. And my grandfather reaches under the couch and he pulls out a package about that big and that big around. I'm like, and he goes, here. I open it up. It was a switchblade. My mother's like, Dad! He's like, relax, he'll be good. I open that thing up and it was a switchblade. I press the button and a fucking comb came out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I never had another party. Uh, I know I've had my ass beat earlier in life, but this is the earliest recollection I got killed. I said, are you fucking kidding me? What am I going to comb somebody to death? <laughs> now I'm about to indict myself, and please, guys, don't, uh, you know, like I said, comedians are in touch with the darker recesses of their mind and get paid to share them. So where you guys walk away and go, that's a fucked up dude. <laughs> like, <laughs> but I got to be open about what happened, you know? So when I got divorced, I uh, got my player's card back. <laughs> I was like, I was a little rusty. So I'm out there in the field having fun, doing whatever you do. And uh, I got bored. I'm like, hey, you know, I started, I started like criteria, like what kind of girl do I want to date? And I was like, why don't I sleep with somebody with a name I've never slept with before? That would be <laughs> like, and then Agatha wanted to kill my cat. And I'm like, <laughs> back over to the Marys and the Sues and the Janes. That didn't work. So then I came up with the, boy, I'm not shallow, I'm just crazy. The two-thirds rule. Face, boobs, and butt. If two, three, two out of three were good, I'd date them. I'm being honest. That got old. Then I came up with the 10-year the rule. And this is going to lead into the worst birthday I ever had. <laughs> if I could lie about being 10 years older than you, then I could date you. So I'm 60. I think I could lie about 50, maybe. Early 50s, so early 40s. That's the limit. I got away with the program, by the way, guys. <laughs> but at the time, I met a waitress, and she was a buxom blonde. <laughs> and she goes, how old are you? And I said, how old are you? She goes, 34. I was 47. I said, I'm 44. It worked. We started dating. And I moved on in my mental midget mind. I never thought about it again. She kind of moved in with me. My daughter loved her. And my birthday rolled around. <laughs> and uh, so I'm in Syracuse on work, and my daughter keeps calling me. What time are you going to get into town? And I'm like, about 6. She goes, no, it's kind of important. Is it before 6, at 6? Or... I go, what do you need? A couple minutes after 6. She goes, perfect. I go, all right, see you, honey. I hung up. I was like, 
about fucking time. For how good a guy I am, about time I have a surprise party. I had to wait all this fucking time. So I'm thinking in my mind, who's all going to be there? And I got about a 60-mile ride going, that's eh, fuck, that's awesome. They put it together. I get home, I open the door, I'm like, wow, I couldn't be more surprised. Like, there's fucking nobody there. I'm like, holy shit. And Marissa's in her bedroom, my daughter, with my girlfriend. We'll be out in a minute. Don't come in. We're wrapping gifts. So here's what was going on <laughs> that side of the door. <laughs> the girl puts a four and a five on the cake. And my daughter, I don't know how the hell we turned into, you know, like Tony and Jamie Lee Curtis or Tatum O'Neill and Ryan O'Neill, but uh, like we're partners in fucking grime. You know, <laughs> my daughter goes, what's that? She's like 17. She goes, it's his birthday. My daughter's like, you fell for the 10 year rule? <laughs> I'm, out in the, I'm out in the living room going, how many fuckers fit in that room? Like this is the best prize, this is the best prize party ever. Like there are like clowns in a Volkswagen at the circus, they're fucking crowded there. They come out singing happy birthday. And Laura was the girl. She had mascara on because I saw it running down her shirt while she was crying. And the four and the five are burning on the cake. My daughter's behind her going. <laughs> and I'm like, like I, you know, I had to wrap my head around all of it. I was like, oh, my daughter's being an asshole. And then, ah, I see the 45. I was like, they come into the kitchen. The girl fucking slams the cake on the counter, cuts it up, and... You could hear fucking forks hit teeth. We're like, kink, kink. <laughs> the girl pounds the table, gets up, leaves, patches out. And I go, well, that went good. I'm like, I told my daughter, what the fuck are you doing? Siding with the enemy. She goes, you're an amateur. I'm like, why would you do that to her? Tell her. I'm like, eh. All of a sudden, I heard the car pull up. I'm like, oh, she came to her senses. <laughs> she walked in the door and had an eight about that big. Fucking slammed down the cake. The icing went to the wall, left, and I never saw her again. <laughs> Needless to say, I got rid of the 10-year rule. <laughs> then I went on to the 100 rule. Me and the girl couldn't equal 100. And then I lived to be 60. So <laughs> Now I'm on the foggy mirror rule. If it, they breathe on it, I'll date them. And then it I started tonight, and, and, and I will end tonight talking about Kevin Dundon. I dedicated tonight's show to him, a friend of mine that passed away. And I want to tell a great story that uh, really happened again. I, uh, I'm an asshole. <laughs> we were hanging out at the Blarney Stone on the south side about 1977. Kevin and I are drinking. And he's like, let's take a ride up to Mill Hill. We'll smoke pot and drink and listen to music. You know, I was like, yeah, well. I'd... So we went up there, and we're listening to AM, PM radio. <laughs> like fucking. And uh, there's a moonlit sky over a field, and we're drinking, and I go, I got to take a piss. So I go out in the field, and I'm pissing. I see, it's like, oh, the best Christmas tree I ever saw in my fucking life. I was like, do you see that fucking tree? It's beautiful. Let's tear it down. <laughs> so he climbs up and grabs the top of the tree, and I grab his feet. We pull the thing down. It bends. And we're kicking it, stopping it. Took us hours. We get it down. We brought it to the bar, and they put it up and decorated it. And the guy that owned the bar goes, that's the most beautiful tree I ever saw. He gave us $35 for it. He's like... Can you give me more? I'm like, can you get you more? We took his money and we went to the hardware store and bought a two-man saw. First thing you do, you got to put money back into your business. So we had to name it. I, I named it East Trees. And uh, so we cut down another one and another one and another one. And we're delivering. We got them on back order. Everybody wants one. And man, there's a ton of them. I was like, this is fucking like, it's an embarrassment of riches. And uh, one night, we're out in the moonlit sky. Paul Morbido went with us because we were going to go for a twofer. We we're going to cut two down. He waited, by, he waited by the road in his car, and Kevin and I got out there. We're sawing the tree down, and the blade came out of the tree. And uh, I go, hold on a minute. And I'm feeling for the crack in the tree, and he saws and cuts my finger. So I let out a scream, which was met with the barrel of a shotgun on the back of my head. Now, I didn't know it was a Christmas tree farm to start with. <laughs> but a uh, couple, give me a week or two more, we would have been near the headquarters. We were, <laughs> like, fucking, we were working our way down. And uh, 
So the guy, they look like Elmer Fudd. They all, they're dressed. So the guy that owns the Christmas tree, this is in, not the major metropolis of Binghamton, the town, okay? And uh, the guy was the town supervisor and a Christmas tree farm owner. So they brought us by gunpoint to the junior high to arraign us. And he says, approach the bench. And by the bench, I mean the JV bench in the basketball court. We were right in the fucking gym. So they said, you need to come back tomorrow night for your penalty. Now, I got to tell you guys, I had probably about $1,200 in my pocket. I'm 17, 18 years old, and it all was from his trees. We get there the next night, and he says, he's a religious man. He goes, I'm going to find you $1 for the spirit of the Lord and a Christmas, because he thought that was the only tree we cut down. That fucking bothered me forever. <laughs> so I mean it. I'll get to it. So he goes, but... You're not going to pay me. You're going to come to the house, apologize to my family, and have dinner with us. So, I mean, you, you want to talk about feeling like a fuck-up. I'm sitting there, and his wife's talking to me, and I'm thinking, I wonder if there's any more trees anywhere else. Like, I got, I got to keep this. He goes, you need to pay us a dollar. I'm like, what mint do you want? I got Denver. I had so much money on me. So I paid him a dollar, and I took off. And I felt like a fucking asshole. I was raised better than that. And it bothered me for years and years and years. And about 1988, 11 years later, I was in Rochester, worked for Dick's Sporting Goods, and I had to come back to Five Mile Point where they had their headquarters for a meeting. And I came in the night before, and we get there, and it was an all-day meeting, and I told my wife I'd be home like 9, 10 at night by the time I got back from Rochester. And the meeting ended at noon. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go find that guy. And it was around Christmas time. I'm going to buy him a tree, I'm going to give him a shitload of money, and I'm going to apologize to him. So I drove up and down every road. As you can imagine, 11 years, you know, you know shit got bigger, dirtier, major. <laughs> I'm going up and down every road, and I can't find him. And uh, all of a sudden, I look, and I see Chad Harris Tree Farm, and the sign's hanging, and all. I see this little old guy. Time was kinder to me than it was to Chet. <laughs> so I pulled in, and I said, are you Chad Harris? He said, who wants to know? <laughs> That's me now, by the way, the curmudgeon. <laughs> who wants to know? Get off of my lawn. <laughs> like, that kind of voice. And I said, I do. I said, I want to buy a Christmas tree from you. I want the best one you have, and I want to give you a tip. And he's like, why? And I said, 11 years ago, I cut a tree down, and I feel guilty about it. He's like, so he cuts a tree down. I gave him like $75. It's about $30, $40 tree. I had like one of them Chevy aluminum vans. They looked like a dust buster. You remember those? <laughs> he ties the tree to the top, and I give him a lot of money. He goes, why are you doing that? I said, because I stole trees from you. He goes, that ah, happens every year. I'm like, what? Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> and, and, and I'm like, I've been carrying that shit for 11 years. <laughs> so I get in the car, and I drive three and a half hours to Rochester and go, you know what? It's kind of poetic justice, isn't it? I mean, I toiled over it for 11 years, and I robbed a guy. He didn't know to what magnitude. When he's cut my tree down, I almost helped him out of habit. <laughs> I, was a, I even recognized some of the stumps. But I drove there three and a half hours, and I get out of my car, and there wasn't one fucking needle on that tree. <laughs> so in the end, I think Chet won out, right? <laughs> Guys, I'm out of time. Thank you very much. Appreciate all of you.